Mike, how, how has the Japanese government been dealing with this so far? Well, they're struggling on multiple fronts. They're dealing with the uh, potential meltdown of uh, Fukushima Daini reactor. They're having trouble getting water to a million plus people, and about three million customers have lost uh, or have power outages. But considering the magnitude of this disaster, um, the response has been prompt, it's been effective, and it's been extremely sophisticated, in large part because they had a similar, uh, not as large, but similarly tragic uh, earthquake hit the uh, Kobe area, the Hanshin part of western Japan, which killed, it killed over 6,000 people. Um, and the government was not ready. I mean, Japan's a country of earthquakes, so they have uh, uh, building codes and preparedness, but they, in the view of most of the public, uh, uh, failed in responding to that. And they spent the next 15 years passing legislation, getting the self-defense forces and the police better coordinated, and drilling and training and creating crisis management centers in local and central government. And it has paid off. Uh, you know, while most of the press is focused on the problems, I think almost any other country in the world with a, with a tsunami and quake this size would have been in, in, in much worse uh, 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 shape in terms of preparedness and response. Are the Japanese people satisfied with the way the government's been responding so far? Yeah, what you see in this crisis is the remarkable um, uh, uh, orderliness and dignity and um, determination and resilience of the Japanese people. There's been no looting. I mean, people don't have bread and food, the, the stores don't have enough stocks, but people are quietly lining up, they're helping eat their neighbors. Uh, it really speaks to the best character of the Japanese uh, public. There are um, questions about whether the government's being totally honest about the nuclear situation, in part because in the past the government hasn't always been uh, fully transparent. And the Japanese public over the last 15, 20 years has become very frustrated with their government and with their politicians because the economy slowed down. Nobody has found the right formula to get it back on track. So there's, there's been deep skepticism about the um, capability of the Japanese government among the people. And so there are some questions, but generally the government has been reacting quite firmly and, and in a determined way. And interestingly, Prime Minister Khan uh, came to power um, as a politician around a crisis um, unrelated, completely unrelated, but over tainted HIV vaccine when he was Minister of Health and Welfare. And he became quite popular and respected because he put all the information out. He was completely transparent. He got ahead of the news cycle. So he's not a national security or a, or a, or a national disaster expert, but he knows this about the Japanese people, that they want to be told straight what's happening. And he's handled it pretty well. You used to live in this part mm -hmm. of Japan that's been hard hit. T tell us how you feel personally about this, and what 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 is life like there, and how how is how are they going to be coping now? It's a beautiful part of Japan along the coast. Um, the uh, area where I lived was is a bit far north, but was also hit pretty badly. Um, the population is pretty old. The average age of Japanese farmers is sixty five, so a lot of people who live along this coast are are older farmers or running resorts or, 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 or in the fishing industry. Um, tragically, a lot of the people who were lost, it seems, were uh, elderly who couldn't get up to the highlands and the high ground in time. But in some cases, uh, like Minami uh, Sanriku, this one village, uh, they were just flattened. There was almost nothing anyone could do. So it's extremely sad to see. Um, the people there have had a hard time because Japan's economy has been slowing. But in reality, it's a, it's, a, it's a dual economy. So Tokyo and Osaka and the cities have, for much of the last decade, been growing at 5%, 6% a year. But in the countryside, there's negative growth. People are really hurting. So uh, it's been tough for them. They're stoic. Um, they're hardworking. Um, and at times of crisis like this, as I said, this is when the Japanese people really or organize themselves and show a real quiet dignity and determination. Um, and they'll rebuild. And, uh, and they're not moving. You, know, you listen to the interviews and people want to stay there. Their families have been there for generations. Um, but it's going to be a huge, huge uh, cleanup if you've seen the footage of some of the damage. Some would say it would take a lifetime to recover from this. Yeah, the, the Kobe earthquake, which people compare it to, cost uh, uh, over $100 billion in damages. Um, the economic minister is saying this one could be even bigger. Some uh, private uh, equity firms are estimating uh, 150 billion or more. As a percent of Japan's GDP, that's comparable to Kobe. 15, 16 years after the Kobe earthquake, the city's beautiful, the roads have been rebuilt. 
but the psychological scar is still very profound, and um, and this is in terms of human suffering uh, going to be probably two, three times larger. So yes, it'll be a generation before the psychological scars heal. Uh, rebuilding um, uh, after Kobe was uh, pretty pretty uh, impressive. Um, so I think we're talking uh, years, uh, a decade. Uh, to rebuild, but as I said, the psychological scars will obviously be much, much deeper and last much longer. You ran um, our Asia mm -hmm. policy out of the National Security Council during mm -hmm. the Bush administration. What should our government be doing right now mm -hmm. to best help the Japanese government and the Japanese people? Well, when I was in the NSC, the uh, government had to respond to the massive tsunami that hit uh, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean tsunami in, uh, in 2004. <clears throat> and uh, it was different in that the damage was spread from uh, India and Sri Lanka to Thailand and Indonesia, and that many of these countries didn't have the capacity and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, and the resources and the training and the technology that Japan has to respond. So in that case, we acted very quickly to send the Seventh Fleet, which was frankly indispensable. In places like Banda Aceh in Indonesia, there were no roads. So it was Navy and Marine Corps helicopters bringing in the basic medical and food and water supplies to keep people alive. In this case, the Japanese self-defense forces are well-trained. There are over 100,000 of them operating, um, and they're used to working with us. And so the, 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 the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, and the Army uh, in Japan and in the Pacific have responded, and they know their counterparts well, uh, and they're playing a supplementary role. And it's the right role. And President Obama called Prime Minister Khan and said, we'll do whatever we can. We have two uh, American disaster relief groups in um, uh, Southern California and in Fairfax County near us that are used to uh, getting a phone call at 2 in the morning and, and, and moving out in 48 hours and they're on their way. They're there already, both of them. So in overall, I think that um, the administration and the American people have responded with a lot of uh, energy and, and, and sympathy, which I think is appreciated in Japan. Other countries have as well. In 95, in the Kobe earthquake, they didn't know what to do with all the foreign help. They were just unprepared. Um, they learned a lesson, and this time I think the foreign help is both appreciated and making a difference uh, uh, in supplementing the, the Japanese capability, which is obviously considerable. Mike Green, thank you very thank much you. for your time.